Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's Lunch and Learn webcast, How Alteryx Enables Predictive Analytics with Time Series Data, hosted by Capitalize Analytics and Alteryx. My name is Scott Trothan. I'm with Alteryx, and I'm joined today by Sean Heiberg and Emily Bache from Capitalize Analytics. Capitalize is one of our preferred partners based out of Houston and have a number of prominent customers and clients of Alteryx that they support uh, in the oil, gas, and energy industries with their data challenges and their data requirements. A few housekeeping items as we get started today. Your lines are muted. If you have questions, please use the Q&A tab in the upper right-hand corner of your WebEx session. We will have a live Q&A session at the end of today's webcast, and we invite you to ask questions of anything that you see, whether uh, if you have questions about the use cases we present today or of the workflow and the demonstration of all tricks that Emily is going to take us through here in just a few moments. Also, we are recording this session today, so if you get distracted, get pulled away, don't worry, we are recording and we will send out a copy of the recording to everyone who registered for today's session. It will also be available on demand on uh, the Alteryx website here in the next day or two. With that, I want to turn it over to Sean Heiberg to begin our presentation and take us through uh, this process of how Alteryx enables advanced and predictive analytics for the oil, gas, and energy industry. Sean, take it away. Really good, Scott. Thanks so much for the uh, introduction. Um, uh, a couple of things in the way that I want to run this uh, through today. If everybody uh, didn't have the opportunity or if you did uh, join us last week, this is really about getting into the use cases from a user standpoint. Uh, I think a lot of times we jump on these calls and we do a lot of talking conceptually, and we really want to spend a lot of time in the Alteryx platform in and of itself um, actually talking about some specific use cases. But to, to set it up a little bit, what we're going to do is give you just a real brief overview of who Capitalize Analytics is, uh, a little bit about the Alteryx uh, platform itself. We'll talk about the use case uh, in particular that uh, Emily is going to discuss today, and then she's going to walk you through a demonstration uh, of the workflows. Uh, we do have some opportunities available for those in the oil, gas, and energy industry uh, to get started with Alteryx. We'll talk about that toward the end, as well as open this up for Q&A. Um, so without further ado, Capitalized Analytics, as Scott said, is a company that is based in Houston, Texas, with an office in Dallas as well. Um, we are a consultancy uh, specifically created for the oil and gas uh, and energy industry. Um, we have worked with a number of different uh, companies across the spectrum, uh, anywhere from simple land management or lease management, I say simple, but you know as well as I do, it can be very difficult, all the way through the upstream, midstream, downstream process, um, and actually doing some work with uh, natural gas providers, electricity providers, renewables, generation, and distribution companies. Um, we are a technology partner of Alteryx, IBM, ThoughtSpot, and Data Robot, as well as a number of different industry solutions, uh, including OSI, which happens to be what brought us to uh, the predictive analytics use case that we're going to talk about today. Um, what we have found and what we teed up with the last webinar was the fact that uh, within the industry, uh, data is everywhere, data is pervasive. Um, and at the same time, finding an orchestration layer that's going to be able to bring all of this together for advanced analytics sometimes uh, can be a little cumbersome. Um, and so as we went down our journey in assisting our customers, what we found was the Alteryx platform. Uh, it offers some of the most easy-to-use interfaces we've ever seen. Um, it is one of the most scalable platforms we've ever seen, and the agility to do everything from general ETL to data blending to data enrichment, um, all the way through the predictive and on to the prescriptive side of the house, um, we found uh, to be second to none. And so we're really excited today to, uh, to present to you what we have seen from the predictive side of the house in regards to time series data, which we know everybody on the call is, is working with. Um, so I want to turn it back over to Scott real quick, let him talk a little bit about the Alteryx platform, uh, and then we'll get into the uh, use case at hand. Scott? Thank you, Sean. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Alteryx or just starting to get familiar with us, 
Alteryx delivers an end-to-end -end platform that is flexible enough to satisfy the line of business analysts, as well as IT and the data scientists. Collaboration, agility, and an analytic pipeline that is flexible are all critical in achieving analytics at scale across your organization. And legacy platforms and point solutions fundamentally lack these properties essential to most modern analytic needs. Alteryx delivers the modern end-to-end -end platform that is purpose-built for today's needs. Our platform is comprised of four capability sets that span the end-to-end -end analytics pipeline. And you'll see them on the screen in front of you here. The first one, discover and collaborate, the ability to find and publish the right data and analytic assets faster in a collaborative and governed environment through data discovery and cataloging. Prepare and blend, allowing you to enable self-service data analytics with drag and drop workflows that allow analysts to connect, prep, and blend all your data wherever it's stored, whether it's in Excel spreadsheets, it's in a database, it's online in the cloud if you're pulling information from different uh, cloud apps such as Salesforce or even NetSuite, if you're pulling information from, uh, from sensors uh, in, in the field, you can do that here. Analyze and model. Develop advanced analytic models in a code-free and code-friendly environment, leveraging visualytics to see how your data changes across your entire workflow. Deploy and manage. Deploy, manage, and monitor analytic models in real time to quickly and confidently deliver answers faster than ever before. And then finally, the ability to scale and govern. You can automate, share, and publish analytic workflows securely across your organization, freeing up time and resources to deliver faster insights to the business. At Alteryx, we help bring all of your analytic talent and teams together to create a culture of analytics at scale across your organization. Sean, I'll turn it back to you to show us an example of, of how the workflows uh, operate, and some of the and, and we'll go into the starting the, go into the use cases there for oil, gas, and energy. Absolutely. Uh, earlier on, one of the things I was talking about was the agility of the Alteryx platform, and I haven't been able to find anything that really represents the agility I'm speaking of better than the slide that I have in front of you right now. Uh, working from left to right, you can see. Uh, where Alteryx enables a number of different inputs uh, capabilities from a number of different data sources. And being able to bring all your different data sources together into one platform to begin to work on the data preparation, the cleansing. Uh, we know with time series data, sometimes it's not the most normalized in the world, and so you need to fill in some of the gaps and the ability to prepare that data for analysis is very important. Um, then you have the blending capabilities where you can start joining multiple data sets together to be able to prevent, to be able to create an environment um, that creates a, uh, a platform for more advanced analytics. Below you have a couple of different uh, options available within Alteryx as well. The uh, geographic analysis from TomTom helps a lot with some of our midstream companies when we're talking about time series or not time series of data, but when we're talking about drive time data from point to point, um, as well as some of the companies we work with when we talk about delivering uh, materials and components out into the field. In addition to that, if you're on the other side of the house and you want to get some demographic information about your customers, if you're an energy provider and you want to see uh, what some of your customers look like and what the ideal customer looks like and you want to enrich that data, it has the capability of doing that with some of the Experian data as well as some data from Dun & Bradstreet. What we're going to focus on is the next bucket which is the predictive analytics side of the house. Um, the ability to bring in different components so that you can start running different models on top of each other to get some scoring and identifying what model may be the best for what you're trying to accomplish within your predictive analytics um, is very important and very key. And I think Emily is going to jump into that a little bit and show us how this works. Uh, but this is a brief overview of, of kind of where that sits. And then we talked about sharing that analysis. How do I get all this information downstream? Uh, in the use case we're talking about today, the customer actually takes, a, takes the data that they have uh, put together and the predictive analytics that they have done um, and serves it up in Tableau uh, and uses the Tableau platform for uh, democratizing the information that they've seen. Um, and further off to the right, you have the uh, collaboration standpoint of uh, what Scott was saying, which is how do I take this information, share it across all of my different analysts, be able to provide uh, environments where they can collaborate with each other, understand what's working, what data is working, what data outputs are working, um, and how they can share that to help uh, create an environment where you are 
not only keeping the data science and the data science team, but you're enabling the citizen data scientist, which is the guy that sits out in the line of business. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the use case that uh, Emily is going to talk about first, and then really turn this over so Scott and I can quit talking and we can get into the actual nuts and bolts of this. Um, we were working with a major offshore driller, um, and we were working with your equipment reliability department. What they were trying to do was say, hey, listen, I have all of this data. I have my maintenance records. I have my financial records. I have information coming to me out of OSI Pi um, about all the different sensors that I, I'm pulling off of the components on the rig. And what I'd like to do is be able to identify, can I see what different parts um, are failing and what are the determinants that cause those to fail? Um, and so the challenge was, uh, within the platform that they were that they were using within their time series database, uh, it didn't allow for the blending uh, and the enriching that came from the corrective maintenance records as well as the financial uh, records uh, associated with the rig. Um, and so it was taking hours of time to be able to put all this together in an Excel spreadsheet, work through the outputs they were getting out of their Pi system, and then blending it with uh, other records. And so they were looking for a better way. The, the ask was, I need to have something that's going to be a little bit more uh, automatic. i got to be able to scale this out so it grows with me because I don't want to wind up with a spreadsheet that's going to break because it gets too big or having to maintain different fee lookups. Um, and I want to be able to create an environment that I can grow on in the event I want to add additional analysis down the road. Um, and so the solution here was obviously the Alteryx system. Um, what we were able to do and what Emily was able to work with the customer in getting accomplished was creating this single orchestration layer to bring all these different components together, get it out of the different systems, blend it with all the different data sets coming from um, either external sources as well as internal sources, and even adding some human records and, uh, associated with different repairs to the mix to be able to get a good idea of not only hey, I had a piece of equipment break, and I think in this particular case we were focusing on a small uh, a small uh, component called a wash pipe, which actually fails relatively regularly, um, to be able to identify whether or not this could happen. And sure enough, by putting together all of this um, analysis in the Alteryx platform, we were able to start serving up to them different reasons and understanding why equipment fails and what are the different factors that are associated with that. Um, from there, this pilot has actually grown in scope and has now encompassed a number of different units across the rigs, and we're talking 125, 200 rigs across uh, across the globe. Um, from there, they're actually running this out now and using Alteryx for rig efficiencies, right? So if you have different seas that are causing different stresses on your different on your turbines, how in the world can I predict what's happening? How can I understand how to be more fuel efficient? How can I understand that whatever rigs or whatever components on the rig are coming up for corrective maintenance, how do I get the ship ready to go and have the parts ready for uh, for the rig whenever it comes off of the well and is, is transitioning to a different well? Um, so that just speaks a little bit to the agility and the scalability of the product. Uh, but what I really want to do is jump into the workflow so you can see how this all works together. It sounds great. Conceptually, it sounds good. But what does it really look like, Sean, and how can I make this work for me? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to Emily and let Emily jump into showing you what the Alteryx workflow actually looks like and then talk about um, some different other capabilities and maybe show you a little bit of a live demo. So. Emily, I am going to pass you presenter rights and turn it over to you. Thank you, Sean. All right, so everybody should be able to see my screen now. And let me pull up our main example. Looks good. So as you can see, this is going to be the example that Sean's been speaking of for our drilling client. As you can see, it's a pretty large workflow, uh, much larger than kind of the example that was shown on the slide. The majority of this is really going to be getting the data ready for the predictive analytics piece. Um, Alteryx is fantastic at simplifying the process of predictive analytics. If you've never touched R or Python or you've never seen these predictive models, that really doesn't matter. You can still be up and running and creating your own predictive models that actually give you great insights within a couple of days. It's really fantastic for that. So I do want to get into kind of each piece of this um, and talk a little bit more about the purpose of this model and specifically what we're looking to do. 
So in this case, we're looking at a very specific component called the uh, wash pipe or you'll see swivel wash pipe. It's referred to a few different ways in here. And that's going to be a critical component of the top drive, which is another main piece of the rig of the hull. And so what we wanted to be able to do is predict out the likelihood of failure of those wash pipes on kind of a time basis in how likely is it to fail 24 hours, 72 hours, or 96 hours from this point. Um, in order to get a probability of failure, the models we used were classification models in which we had records that were, uh, we knew were either failed or not failed and used those in order to kind of teach our model uh, what the normal variables were when there wasn't a fail versus when there wasn't, and then use that out to predict based on our kind of new records uh, if those would be likely to fail or not. How this is organized, on the left-hand side, we're going to have all of our pieces of actually bringing our data in, any blending or joining you have to do, get it into one cohesive data set. Uh, the final data set you want to put into any predictive model really the uh, least amount of unknown variables is the best because you are trying to get connections of your predictive variables into the target that you're actually trying to predict. Uh, the mid piece is where we do some final kind of blending and filtering on our full data set. And then the kind of last third over here is going to be where we actually do our predictive modeling. I do want to get in still at a high level, but talk a little bit about the blending we did since I would say, uh, for the most part, the blending and preparation of your data for the predictive piece is going to be kind of the biggest challenge, especially in the oil and gas industry, where you might have a lot of different connections, data in a lot of different places, and you don't always have um, a fantastic system where everything joined perfectly. So here, we connected to at least three completely different systems, and the only real connection we had to go on in order to make a cohesive data set was knowing which rig we're looking at, which is recorded across all systems, and then we could look at time. So the majority of this data is time series data, and that's a big piece we use in order to actually connect the data with each other. So each one of these boxes, and these boxes are fantastic. They're actually tools in Alteryx that lets you enable or disable pieces of your workflow. So instead of creating new workflow or deleting pieces, you can just disable piece and keep, and keep running. So first off, we pulled in, um, we needed some categorical variables as well as some numeric variables. Your categorical variables are going to be things like your make and manufacturer, um, just general descriptors of the problem you're looking at. And the numeric things are going to be more of our sensor data. So anything we could pull from the OSI system or from uh, like a SCADA or a time log where we actually had, a, you know, pressure, circulation, drilling, and numbers to go along with those. So the first piece, we just pulled some basic top drive manufacturer information. In the next section, so we're looking at trying to figure out if the wash pipes are going to fail. So we have to get a decent amount of the wash pipes, and that's the ultimate level we want to join everything on, is what are the um, kind of descriptors, what are the variables that go along with the installation of each wash pipe. So then from a different system, we had to pull our wash pipe data, we had to calculate out how long each wash pipe has been installed and also determine which ones failed and which ones had not. Some other variables we wanted to look at that we kind of knew were important were uh, the actual fluid type or the mud type within the uh, drilling site. And so, what you know, whether it was water or whether it was more abrasive fluid, that could affect if the wash pipe was going to fail. And so, for this, you may notice that uh, these workflows look a little different. So we have the civil wash pipe we're pulling data right here. And these tools, if you've ever seen Alteryx before, these are kind of the, the typical normal tools that you would use in Alteryx. And one thing uh, to know about Alteryx is when you're using the standard tools, everything is processing in the memory of your PC. Unless you're running it through a gallery, if you're, as long as you're running on, on a desktop, you're using your PC memory. Now, there are some cases where you're going to have, especially with time series data and especially with sensor data, where you could be, you know, recording every second, you're going to have tons of records. I mean, you, uh, in this case, we had over 100,000 records in our time series, and that could easily go up into the millions when we add more RICs. We didn't need the time series data on the level that it was being presented. We didn't need it every second. We just needed this data for the length of the wash pipe installation. So we kind of needed to roll it up. Um, so 
since the wash pipe was installed for about four months, we just need to know, okay, what fluid was there for over that four month period, not which fluid was being used, you know, each and every day. These tools are actually going to be in database tools. And what that means is instead of processing on your local hardware or your local PC, they're going to use uh, the database in order to process. So the database, especially for you know, an enterprise company, is going to have a lot more power and we'll be able to process records, uh, like 100,000 records in maybe a second, whereas your PC might take a few minutes. And so when we had a lot, a lot of data that we knew we needed to just roll up, the actual process of pulling the data in and rolling it up to a high level, we used these in-database tools. And then once we got it to that level, since the only connection we really had between things like MUD, and then again, we had a similar setup for the circulating and rotating or drilling hours, the only real connection we had was we knew the rig and we knew the time. But we also knew the time of the wash pipe, so we were able to actually use the effective dates in order to join, in order to say, okay, since this is the same rig and it was happening at the same time, this is how many hours we can account to this rig, and then these are the mud types we can account to as well. And then once uh, we got out of needing the in database, we got it rolled up to the level we needed, we actually streamed back into the Alteryx tool. In order to join to typical Alteryx tools, they'll, you need to use the normal ones rather than database ones, and so we have to stream our data out, and now we have much fewer records, we go from about 100,000 to 1,000, which is much easier for a desktop to handle, you're doing kind of quick analysis. The last piece, and probably the one we kind of had to do the most data processing for, would be our sensor data. Uh, specifically, the OSI system has a lot of uh, configuration done, and it's very specific to the client who's using it. And so we had to kind of pull through, pull that through and do a decent amount of manipulation in order to get it to a state where we were looking at it just for the time period of the wash pipe again. But we also had, depending on the rig, different units of measurement. So we needed to pull pressure, but um, the actual pressure units, and we know we had some in Pascal, some in Spatai, we had to normalize it, so we're looking at the same unit and we can compare it. So that's another thing that we did before adding it into our main data set. Once we were able to kind of get all the data blended out and really get rid of any null records and just get the ones that are really connected to each other, we joined them all together. A little bit of imputation, if we could, if we had uh, numeric values that we knew we could insert zeros into just to get a better prediction. And we also filtered out any extra data that we didn't want included. All right, so now we had our data set and we we're ready to run it into our final model and actually get to the predictive piece. So some of the things we're looking at right here, we're looking at uh, the swivel making manufacturer, the top five making manufacturer, our rotating and circulating hours, as well as some of the uh, sensor data like pressure. And we have all these different, especially with the numeric variables, uh, we have all these different units, once again. In order for the models to process them and compare them effectively, we need to have them all uh, normalized. And so the first thing you want to do before actually putting your data into any of these models is to normalize any numeric variables. Any type of categorical variables, like the major manufacturer, the models can, can take in as is, but it will get, you'll get some really crazy results if you just try to put in numbers as they are because you're not specifying units. And so what we can do to normalize is uh, we just take the kind of the range, so the actual, say you have uh, the age of the soil pipe, you take the age less the minimum age of your entire data set and then divide that by the range of ages. And then that way for each numeric, you kind of get uh, a number between zero and one for every record, for every numeric piece, so they can be compared and you can see, okay, you know, when age is higher, closer to one, it's, maybe it's more likely that they're gonna fail. Once we normalize the variables, uh, we have kind of our final data set and we have to get our samples out. So with this piece, since we're doing a classification model and we're trying to categorize what's the likelihood of failing or not failing, we need to first teach the models, okay, well, what variables are most likely to lead to a failure? And so we use the Create Samples tool in Alteryx, and what that allows us to do, let me zoom in, is we have an estimation, validation, and holdout that we can create. In this case, we only use, used our estimation and validation because we uh, ended up using a different type of data for actually scoring. So our estimation set is actually going to be the set that the models 
use in order to kind of determine, okay, which variables are most likely to predict and really learn the data set and the correlations. So validation is going to be what's used later in our list chart that we'll go over to compare how accurate your model was. So you'll put your estimation in, the models will actually uh, estimate out your validation samples, and then the list chart is going to compare, okay, here's my actual, here's what actually happened, here are my predictions, how close were they, how accurate are they? And since we have a tool that's able to do that, it allows us to determine, okay, which model is the best, because it actually tells us pretty easily in visual and numeric forms which model is most accurate. The next thing I needed to do after getting my estimation sample is I needed to oversample the estimation. Now, this was because it's a case of uh, failure, and one where failure is not likely to happen you know, all the time. And so in our data set, we only had a 5% chance of failure. If we would have set the data set into the model exactly with that, with 95% don't fail, 5% do, most likely that's gonna to lead to um, over-prediction of non-failures. And so really your best data sets are ones that are pretty balanced, as close to 50% or 50% as possible, is gonna get you the best learning model. So here we use the oversample tool, which is another kind of basic tool in Alteryx, to set the, instead of 5%, we upped it, I think, to about 30%. So we had a much bigger sampling of no's, and we wouldn't get too much of an overprediction on yes for the failures. Now the next piece, you'll notice that I have four different models here. And we only need to use one in order to predict. But we want to be able to compare, okay, which model is the best. And so that's where, let me zoom out a little bit, that's where the list chart's going to come in. And I do like sometimes leaving the comparisons in workflows, because especially when you're doing a model in real time, and it's a supervised learning model where your data could be changing, and based on your changing data, uh, what your model are learning could be changing, and maybe one, uh, what was the best model, you know, last year, might not be the best model today. So kind of keeping that comparison can be great, so you can look sometimes and say, okay, are we still using the best model for our purpose? Is it still the most accurate? In this case, I chose some of the kind of basic classification model tools in Alteryx, which is we have decision tree, which is kind of a, a tried and true older kind of classification model. Forest is a little more advanced version of the decision tree. So just a regression is probably one of the most basic kind of predictive tools. And then boosted is gonna be, have a little bit of decision tree. <laughs> and then an ensemble of a lot of different classification models in order to predict from there. Now we have each model set out, and then we take the outputs of each model and union them together. And from that union, the lift chart tool is able to take them in. What the lift chart tool is going to do, as I said earlier, is going to take the outputs, which are basically the estimations how the models are estimating records, and compare the prediction to the validation sample. And then it'll give us a visual output to tell us which one's the most accurate. In this case, and I'm not going to, I think I mentioned this, we're not gonna actually run this one since it was a production model and we don't have all the connections, but I am going to do a live demo as soon as we kind of finish this one using these tools, and I'll show you the configurations and what lift chart results actually do look like. So in this case, we found out that the boosted model was the most accurate, and so that's the one we connected to our scoring pieces. The scoring tool is gonna to be what's actually going to tell us a, it's a 90% chance of failure, but 20% shows with chance of not. And all you have to do in order to score, really is hook up the output of your preferred model. If we found out another model was being better, it'd be a very simple change to just change the connection to the better working model. Now the other piece we needed to do in here, since we're using a classification model where it's just going to tell us this is the percentage likelihood of failure, we left out the actual time piece because we opted for a classification and probability type model. But we still wanna know, okay, what's the likelihood of failure in 48 hours, 72 hours, or 96 hours? In order to do that, uh, we came up with a way to actually predict out the numeric records. So for any type of the categorical variables like the make and manufacturer, or the, even the age, those are very easy to predict, and we would just assume that over you know, five days, our make and model aren't gonna change. So we'll keep those records the same. And these are the records we're actually going to try to score. 
in order to get a probability of failure. But for things like rotating and drilling time or pressure or any of the sensor data, we need data that would actually represent what it would look like in 48, 72, or 96 hours. In order to do that, we were able to use Alteryx time series tools. So here's an example of how we were able to predict out the rotating and drilling hours in order to set a new set of records that would be scored for prediction. So we're basically predicting out what our wash pipe is going to look like in a few days, uh, what the variables are going to be. Based on those variables, how likely is it to fail? So here, uh, this is really similar to what we did earlier using the end database tools, because once again, we're dealing with uh, time logs with a ton of data, and we didn't necessarily need all of that data to do the prediction. So we rolled it up again, filtered out anything that was unnecessary. And then just looking at the data from about the last week, we wanted to predict what the next week would look like as far as we're hitting in drilling time. We, did, we were able to look at many rigs at once and uh, kind of forecast them all together by using tools that, uh, we're using a few Alteryx macros that are freely available in the Alteryx community. So there's some time series tools that would be able to process time series for one rig at once. But with these macros that are called the time series factories, we're able to process all of the rigs at once, which is pretty awesome. So there's also a lot with all six, even past the basic tool set you can do a ton with, but even past that, there are a ton of macros freely available that you can add to really enrich your workflows. So what we did here was we uh, kind of organized all of our rig data together, got to be from dates in a single column, and then we used the fill time series dates, which is the tool I really like for a time series. It's actually, if you miss a day, say when you're actually recording, like you when something is zero, you just don't record at all. You only record in your database when something's greater or less than zero, maybe. So the fill time series dates is actually going to fill in those dates that you're missing and give you just, and then you can put in a value of zero to go with it. Having a continuous set of dates is going to make your uh, prediction predictive model a little bit stronger. So being able to use this tool to easily fill in those dates and not have to make them yourself is really fantastic. Okay, once we filled in the dates, um, got them ready to run through the time series factory tool, specifically using the ARINA model, which is going to be um, like autoregressive moving average type, which I found uh, the time series basics is you're going to use the moving average or the exponential smoothing method, which is going to be our ETS model, and uh, there's also tools to test which one is better with uh, some comparison time series tools. In this case, the moving average turned out to be have a little better predictive power. We then used the forecast factory tool in order to forecast out for every rig what our rotating circulating numbers would be over the next seven days. I took that output, that predictive forecast, and then loaded it right back into the main model. And so now we have calculations in order to kind of pull out any categorical variables. So we'll make our new records, we'll add the same make manufacturers, uh, add a few, a couple days to the age, depending on which one we're looking at, and then any numeric, we'll grab the forecast and add that to the records as well. Then those records, which are our predictions for what the wash pipe will look like in two days, those are scored based on our model. And then we have, uh, we union them, we get scores for 48 hours, 72 hours, and 96 hours, and then join them all together to get a final score, which will show us kind of each day what the probability of failure is. And we were able to get some pretty good uh, records from there that reflected what we thought we, we should get, which is, you know, as drilling and circulating increase, as time increases, the walk is gonna be more likely to fail. Now, since we can't run through this, I still wanna show how exactly how easy it is to use some of these modeling tools. And so what I have here is an incomplete example. What I've done so far is just gotten the data ready to run into the predictive pieces. In this case, uh, I was able to get a, a data set made for machine learning on the uh, USI machine or UCI machine learning repository, kind of freely available data set. And this one is actually from when crunchers were used very often. And 
uh, one of the mechanical failures of the printer was it creating a band. And so the point of this data set and any, um, what we're going to run on it is how likely is it that this printer that we're looking at is going to create a band? What's the percent chance? So all of the work of actually getting all of the important variables joined together was already done in the data set. So it was a great one to start with just to look at the predictive side. I did have to do just a little bit of housekeeping to remove some unknown records to make it a little easier to run through. And then um, every select statement was able to select just the variables that I really, that were going to be important. Also, uh, in this case, I used a text file, and so everything came in as strings. The great thing about your select tool is you can go in and change your data type. That's the same place where you can change, uh, pick which columns you want to use, and you can rename that change description, which is incredibly useful. Uh, another piece I did was to count what different band types I'm looking at, and that way I could get an idea, like I said earlier, depending on when you're looking at your uh, target variable, what's the percentage of each, you want it to be as close to 50-50 as possible, get the best predictions. This one is about 40-60. So I did not do any oversampling in this one. It was already kind of a really great data set to put through a predicted model. And also note that this was also originally time data. We didn't end up really using the timestamps uh, because we we're just trying to do a classification method to get the percentage likelihood. But we could go back and do something like we had earlier where we use time chance to forecast out some of our numeric pieces and then bring, you know, those time predictions back into the workflow. All right, so also over here, we had to do normalization. So this is, it's really the exact same thing as that model earlier. It is just with a slightly different data set. But the great thing about this is you can kind of get a template workflow and use it for whatever data sets you have, and you're doing kind of the same thing over and over again, but still getting great insights, because most of these tools are auto-configured to just work with what you're, the data you're putting in. So this is what, uh, what I mentioned earlier, a normalization formula. So these were all of the numeric variables we were looking at, and in this data set we had a lot, uh, more, a lot more variables to actually put into our model. And so we just take whatever the variable is for that record, minus the minimum over the entire data set over the range to get that value between one and zero for every numeric piece. Uh, next we wanted to select, and anything that was really specific to that record and really had nothing to do with predicting out, we just removed. So things like the timestamp, uh, the cylinder number was different for each one. We don't want that, we want to use variables that we can group by, really, because those are better for predicting. We don't want to use something that's unique for every record. Okay, and the last thing was, uh, before we get into the actual predictive tools, was the estimation, validation, and holdout. In this case, we are going to use a holdout in order to score. And we set our estimation sample at uh, 45. We'll use that to teach 33% to validate, and the remaining will be what we actually score at the end to see how close our predictions are. This is going to be pretty quick. I'm going to use all of these tools just totally default, and we'll see how well we can predict out whether we're going to get a band or not. I'm going to use almost all the tools we had in the last example and the drilling examples, except for the logistic regression, because I know that one just doesn't work well. But these three all have um, pretty good results here, even though one we'll see is clearly the best. All right, so we're looking at, we just pulled in decision tree, forest, and boosted models, and connected them to my estimation sample set. Now, in each one, we do have to tell it, okay, what target variable we're looking at, what are we trying to predict, and then what predictive variables do you want to use? So, we know that we want to predict out band type. And then I can just select all of these, and then I'm gonna go look for band type because it's still gonna be in here. Now I don't, um, my band type should not be a predictive variable because that's what I'm trying to predict, so that'd be a little too perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna do that for each one. My target variable is going to be band type, then quickly select all, and just remove that one checkbox. All right, so we've got our model configured. 
Last about it. If you do know predictive analytics really well and you want to get into the nitty gritty of the code and change every parameter, you absolutely can. Just follow kind of customize on some of the, the newer ones or within some of the kind of older models, you can go to the model customization tab. So you can get into the code of these and change them kind of however you want, but the auto settings are actually really great. And I would recommend, especially if you're the first time in here, to just use the tools kind of as they are. All right, so what we also want to be able to do is view the outputs. So each one of these has a little mini report that it generates that gives you some different information that can be really useful. The decision tree happens to have an info tab too, so we'll pull that. And then we're going to add our union because we want to be able to union all three together. And this way they can be input into the lift chart. We're going to go back to our predictive piece and grab our lift chart. There we go. And as I said earlier, we need to put our validation data into the lift chart. So now it has uh, the validation data. And it's also going to have the outputs of the model. And then we do want to be able to view the output here as well. I'm using the browse tool, which allows us to view the outputs without actually saving any type of files anywhere on your PC. All right, so now I want to actually run this and we'll see if we can get a result on our lift chart to tell us which model is kind of looking the best right now. It should take it really takes about 30 seconds to run, and you can see on each piece uh, how far along each model is. You can absolutely, if you build one of these models and find that you just know this model is going to work the best every time, you can take off the other pieces, take off the testing piece to kind of speed up performance. You know what? That's doing live. I did not set this. All right, so in the lift chart, there are a couple configuration options that I do need to check, but it, it was telling me what I should have done. I just didn't see it. All right, so it wants to know the true response rate. That's going to be whatever we're looking at, which in this case is band. We want to predict out how often the band classification, actually there is a band, but right? So our band type is either band or no band. So 37% of the time, which I was able to calculate out using a summary, when I actually uh, look at how many have band or no band, that 135 represents about 37% of the total. So I set that the true response rate is 37%, and uh, I'm looking at band. Turn on this one more time. We got some warnings, but no errors, which is good. Some of these warnings that are actually really useful as you're looking at it, um, if you have a variable with just a ton of different categories to the point that it's almost unique for every record, then it might not get pulled into your estimation sample. And if it doesn't get pulled into your estimation sample, then your models aren't gonna know how to deal with that category. So using categorical predictive variables that can be grouped pretty well across your data set is the best. The more unique they are per variable, you're probably more likely that it's going to be left out of the scoring or a, a lift chart because it's not going to be great in predicting, right? Okay, so here we actually 
we can see the lift chart. So, um, I think since I don't name it forest, it's getting all mad at me. And okay. So then it looks like the forest and the boosted are giving us about the same, and the decision tree is clearly going to be lower. I think, yes, so actually, I think what happened here, but since I didn't name them, went through a little quickly, it just gave me the forest output. But I know from my completed one that the forest is going to be the best. So rather than run it again right now, I know forest is the best, I know that this is my output from my forest. And from a decision tree, or sorry, from a lift chart, this, let me make this a little bigger for you guys. This line right through the middle is going to represent the accuracy of random guesses. The higher the lines are from the midline, the better accuracy you're going to have. And so this is actually a pretty good shape for predictive. And then the other piece you can look at to actually see, okay, which one's the best. You want your area under the lip chart to be as high as possible. In this uh, Gini coefficient to be as high as possible. I think if this one still has results, this is a completed version of this one. Yes, okay. So this one was run recently, and I can just show you what it normally looks like. So with the forest, it's just a little bit higher than the boosted, but they're pretty similar. So the forest gives us the best results. So we're going to choose the forest and score that real quick. First, I'm going to create a select statement for my holdout. Okay, the only real reason I'm doing that is because I want my band type to be right at the bottom, because I want to be able to compare my band type to the scores that I get. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm grabbing the holdout samples. These are records that were not included in either the estimation samples that were used to teach the models or the validation sample that was used to verify the models. The holdouts are records that haven't had any processing um, done to them past this piece you stack here, and we're going to be able to score their probability. Also, real quick, before we jump into that, we didn't actually look at these reports. So these are some of the really neat reports that these tools are going to give you right away. So this is something that the boosted model and the forest model both give you, which is variable importance plot, although they do it on a slightly different scale. So the boost model is going to give you relative importance. And you can see that certain of these variables are going to matter a lot more in predicting, and these few down here don't seem to have as much of an impact. So actually being able to run through your model can really help you shape the variables that you choose. And then we can also see the in samples versus the cross validation. We have percentage errors for different number of trees if you want to get down to that. And another one that's pretty easy to read is going to be your variable importance plot again, which if you might notice that it's pretty similar to the boosted. So uh, the data is pretty consistent, and this goes with what we saw, where the forest and boosted were pretty similar in how well they were able to process and predict out the data. Instead of importance here, we're saying the mean decreased Gini coefficient. But as far as reading it, it's pretty similar where the further along you're going to have your uh, dots is the more important it's going to be. All right, so let's get to scoring. Too much time. All right. So we'll put our data in, and then we'll actually grab the output from our forest model. And then I'm going to add a sort, because I want to sort by the predictions. So actually, I'm going to have to run it one time. And once I run it, I'll get the, the scores. I'll be able to see the score for band and score for no band. The configuration of the scoring, you can name it whatever you want. If you have oversampling, like I did in the drilling example, you can set that so that it can account for your oversample and give you more accurate uh, scoring. So let's run this again. The lift chart should also be fixed on this run because I added an Sometimes with the predictive um, tools, just so you guys know, you will have to run in order for metadata to be, to be populated. So 
So before I can add um, a sorting tool to sort by my score of band or score of no band, I actually have to run the scoring for it to generate those fields in the first place, and then my next tool can pick it up. So when you're building um, these predictive pieces, you're going to have a lot of kind of running to generate metadata in order to keep working. Our output, notice we have scores for bands and scores for no bands. And now that I have those new columns created, I can sort based on my score for a band. I'll sort it the ascending. And also, since we used a holdout sample, I still had band types set on there. So I'm going to be able to compare based on scoring how good it was at telling me whether there was a band or not. So we'll do kind of our own little validation check with this. And we'll use the browse tool. All right, so this should be our last run. And Emily, you mentioned earlier, uh, but a question has come in, in terms of, you know, do you need to have a predictive background, know how to code in R or Python in order to run these tools and run these models? Um, the, the question, that, you know, at least from the Alteric side is, is no, this is what we call uh, code-free, uh, where we've already built, uh, you know, these tools based on the R programming language so that they can uh, run and, you know, you don't have to go and program. But we also refer to these tools as, as code friendly in that uh, the folks who uh, are, uh, you know, well versed in Python or R and have their own predictive models already built, you can incorporate those models within the tools themselves uh, and you can also uh, use the code within Alteryx and within your workflows. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, one thing, a big reason why I wanted to do this piece live was to show all of these tools, I didn't change any of the settings, really, besides like a, a couple configuration pieces where I say, you know, true response rate. Um, it's just really, really basic configuration options, and everything else is just set to auto. Like, they're, they're very well configured already to give you the best output. So no, no coding background needed. Uh, all right, and you can see here how well our model did. It's very kind of simple, quick put together model. On these scores of band, this is how likely we would be to have a band. And you notice as we have higher scores of band, that was for records that had bands. Note that even though we're seeing band type here, that was not considered in the predictive piece. So it was able to be added here, but because we didn't choose it in our uh, predictor variable, it was not considered. So these scores would be the exact same whether I had band type in there or not. It's just kind of a visual. Once you get down into like the mid ranges, it, your predictions aren't as accurate, but that's expected. You're getting closer to 50-50 where it could be a toss-up. But when you're in these higher confidence intervals, it actually did really well. So he, here we have higher scores of no bands. These are in the 90s, and they're all no bands, as we would expect. So this is a really kind of simple, fast, I was able to put this together in really like a, a few hours. And it's totally possible for really anybody, as long as you can either find a data set or you have a data set, to do something just like this and start kind of playing and looking at predictive models and making your own insights. That's kind of the end of my demo, so I'll open it up for more questions. Yeah, very good. One of the things, uh, Emily, and thanks very much for doing that, one of the things I wanted to point out, and it's something that we see quite a bit, is there are a number of different other uh, products out there that do some of the same things that Emily was talking about. Well, one of the things I like about the Alteryx platform is that not only do you have the capability of going through the workflow and identifying and documenting exactly what you're doing, but when you run a workflow, instead of the system kicking you out as if you have an error to where you've got to go back into the, go, to the code 
and find out where that error uh, persists, um, it very easily called it out for you. So sometimes live demos are awesome. Uh, for the case uh, today, it actually had an error, and Emily was very quickly able to identify where that error came from, make the fix, and continue working without having to dig into the code and find it. So that's one of the things that we're talking about uh, when you start talking about code friendly as well as code free. Um, I didn't have to dig into lines of code to be able to find out where my error was. And the system in and of itself didn't uh, just boot me out and say, hey, good luck, find it and fix it. So hopefully today what you were able to see, and, and again, we're opening this up to the Q&A, so if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, click on the Q&A tab and, and type your questions in. Um, what we were wanting to explain to you today and show you today is uh, exactly what Emily was able to, uh, to portray to us, which was I can very easily create something that is uh, reusable. Um, I can create uh, an output that I can then bring back into an existing workflow or existing predictive workflow to be able to enrich my workflow uh, and get better analytics. Um, the scalability of being able to add uh, a number of different components as I uh, continue to grow out my my sampling, uh, the capabilities are there. Um, if you notice some of the icons that she was bringing in, uh, they're all color coded, so it gives you the capability of understanding based upon the color of the tool um, what you are doing. Uh, so you can very easily adapt to bring this, uh, bring Alteryx in, understand what's happening, understand um, and, and a very easy way of uh, being able to visually see what it is that you're, these different tools are trying to do, create the documentation, understand the predictive analytics side, uh, and then compare a number of different, um, um, you know, predictive variables, if you will, to be able to uh, compare against each other to determine what's best for the product that you're looking for, the output that you're expecting. Um, Again, we got this open for some Q and A. If there's any, uh, if there's any uh, Q and A or any questions that you might have, feel free to uh, to click the box. Emily, if you could go to the next page, I want to talk about uh, the final um, series, if you will. One more, please. Uh, the final series of this uh, of our lunch and learns, which is going to be um, geospatial. So we've uh, been demonstrating over the course of the last couple of weeks the Alteryx platform from a data blending and prepping tool, as well as creating some macros to, to automatically bring in some third-party uh, third party data sets via API that uh, gets you into an automated type of situation. Um, moving that then down toward the predictive components, which Emily did a great job of showing us today um, how that might look. Um, and then next week, what we want to talk about is geospatial. Like, what is this, you know, I've got all this data, maybe I want to see what it looks like on a map. Um, I've got all this data and I want to be able to create something that can out for, uh, output to uh, Google Maps. Um, and so we want to dig a little bit into that aspect of it all as we start discussing and really um, demonstrating the, again, the scalability um, and the agility of the uh, Alteryx platform. I want to be very uh, wary of everybody's time. Uh, we are coming up on uh, the one o'clock hour here in Houston, Texas. We want to thank you very much for taking an hour out of your day to join us for this. As Scott mentioned in the front end, we will be sharing this uh, recording with everybody that attended. And for those that, uh, that did register, we'll be sending this out as well. Please feel free to reach out to either myself or uh, your Alteryx rep for any questions um, that might come up as, as you take some of this information. And I know sometimes these demonstrations are like drinking from a fire hose and there's a whole lot of information to, to absorb. But as you start contextualizing it and you have questions about how this might uh, work in, uh, in your specific area, um, feel free to reach out to either Alteryx or Capitalize and, and we'd love to uh, walk you through um, what this might look like and how this could work in your environment. Um, Perfect. And, and that, uh, Emily, if you want to go ahead and uh, forward to the next uh, slide there, we have uh, Sean's information there. There was, you know, for, or actually the next slide after that, there, Sean. There's, uh, you know, the, we have a, a question here in terms of, you know, hey, can we get a closer look at the workflows and uh, that were presented today? And uh, if you uh, would like to uh, learn a little bit more about uh, the work that 
Emily has done and that Capitalized Consulting uh, has done within Alteryx and how you can leverage that at your, at your own business, uh, please feel free to contact Sean there. Uh, his email and uh, phone number are listed there. Uh, as Sean indicated, you can also reach out to your Alteryx rep and uh, get in contact uh, with us and with Capitalize that way. So, um, Sean and uh, Emily, thank you so much for presenting today. Very much appreciate all of your expertise and knowledge here. And uh, I think we've got that. Yep, the Q&A is, is now clear. So um, that's perfect. On, on behalf of, of Alteryx and, and Capitalize Analytics, we want to thank you for attending today's session. Reach out to uh, Capitalize uh, if you have any questions. And uh, as Sean indicated, we will be sending out the replay. And with that email, when we send out the replay to everyone, there will be a registration link for the next webinar series coming up here next Thursday at noon uh, that will be focused on geospatial. So, uh, Sean, thank you so much for presenting today again. And Emily, thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Scott. Everybody enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Take care, everyone. We'll catch you on down the trail.